I had no friends. You know how it is when you're trying to make friends in a new place. I went through the Starbucks drive through like I always did, and I ordered a decaf cappuccino grande. And by mistake, the barista gave me a caffeinated one. And I went home and started writing Lilac Girls. It just kept pouring out. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me today is my mother and co-host, Caroline Kilborn. And hello, everyone, and we're very happy in Iowa because spring is on the way. Yay, yay. And with spring comes flowers, yes. and that is a lead-in to uh, for you to introduce our guest today. The author of Lost Roses. And that is Martha Hall Kelly. And she is the New York Times best-selling author of Lilac Girls. She lives in Connecticut, where she spends her days filling legal pads, legal pads with stories and reading World War II books. Lost Roses is her second novel. And it's, it's a page-turner, so be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Writer's Voices, Martha. Thank you for having me. I love having my book described as a page turner. That's right. <laughs> so let's, staying on the flower theme here, um, Lilac Girls, of course, and Lilac's one of the first flowers of spring here in Iowa, and now Lost Roses. What, uh, what brought about this flower theme? You know, I've always loved flowers. I, I actually didn't um, have an intention of writing anything really i i uh i'm not an author and uh, <laughs> oh, oh, go, oh, oh now i think you are <laughs> but I, before i started writing uh lilac girls i never thought about writing a novel and um it, it just kind of happened because i discovered I, I stumbled on the story really when i visited a museum up in connecticut very close to where i live now and I, the tour guide told me the story of Caroline and how she brought uh, all these women that had been operated on at Ravensburg concentration camp, how Caroline brought them to the U.S. for rehabilitation and she helped get them reparations. I just thought, it's such an incredible story. How does that get lost? So that's what compelled me to become a writer. And I just started writing. I didn't know anything about it. And I had gone up that day to see the house because of the gardens. And I, my mom had just passed away, and um, she loved lilacs. And I love lilacs, too. They're one of my favorite flowers. And Caroline had a very, has a very famous garden there. She passed away in 1990, so I, I never got to meet her. But I, I went up there to see the lilacs, and they did not disappoint. It was peak lilac time. And... Oh. It's the end of, of uh, May, I know, and the air was just thick with lilac. It, and they had, uh, <laughs> Caroline and her mother, Eliza, had traveled all over the world bringing back specimen plants and, and planting them there, and they were very generous. Mrs. Mrs. Faraday, Eliza, is especially so, because people would come over and she would give them cuttings. And so all around Bethlehem, which is a sweet little town in um, upstate Connecticut, there are these uh, lilac trees that are kind of the, the children of those lilacs. So it, it was it's just a lovely and inspiring garden to visit. They also have incredible roses, uh, <laughs> old varieties of roses, not what you would typically think of as like a tea rose or a hybrid rose. They're, they're very old uh, roses. So um, I just had a... a a ball walking around that garden. It's not tremendously large, but it's just, it's one of the, the last gardens um, of its time that has been left intact because so often they're, you know, plowed under and tennis courts are built over them, but not, not at that house. So, but the garden was what brought me there. But once I went in and heard the story and I only did it on a whim, I thought, well, I'm here. I might as well go listen to the story. I was the only one on the tour that day. And <laughs> I'm really friends. <laughs> wow. Now, you mentioned that the roses there are the old-fashioned roses. In my experience, um, you know, tea roses, hybrid roses can be very, very picky, but the old roses just grow and grow and grow, and they bloom and bloom and bloom. Well, you know, you know the um, 
the scent has also been bred out of them. And so now it's kind of sad when you see this beautiful rose in a garden and you go to smell it and it, it there's no scent at all. Yeah, but those right. old roses, they, oh, mm. the scent is just amazing. And Caroline had her favorites, of course. So give us the kind of the background of this family. How oh, did they come to the U.S.? How long were they here? What was their role? Uh, the Faraday family? Yes. yes. They, uh, well, Caroline was uh, descended from these incredible women, uh, staunch abolitionists called the Wolseley women. And they were, they had Mayflower heritage and they were from Boston, actually. And uh, if you go back to Caroline's great grandmother, uh, and her name was Jane Eliza Woolsey. She lost her husband when her she had her eighth child. She was about to deliver her eighth child. She had seven oh. girls and one boy, and the boy came after horribly, tragically. Mr. Woolsey was um, killed aboard a um, a ship that he was commuting on from New York to Boston at sea and there was a fire um, on board the ship and, and only a few people survived. And it was a real tragedy for their family, but it, 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 her strength was amazing, Jane Eliza. And her daughters uh, during the Civil War, uh, three of them went on to be Civil War nurses and her, the mom served with them at Gettysburg. It's just an amazing story. So um, Caroline's mom, is um, descended from the Wolseleys, and uh, she married Henry Faraday, and he was from Louisiana uh, by way of Pennsylvania, uh, and he was from a very wealthy family, but not quite as kind of old money as the, the Wolseleys were. So those were um, Eliza's two parents. So Caroline was from a very privileged New York society family. So in Lilac Girls, you wrote about um, Caroline. Yes. And in Lost Roses, you're writing about her mother. Exactly. We go yeah. back in time. So it's a pretty, <laughs> I know it's, it's confusing a little bit, but I think people, people have been enjoying it so far. So I, once I finished Lilac Girls and it was, a, a hit, I guess you could say, I went back to yeah. my publisher and said, you know, I've done so much research on this family and I've come to love them so much. And I think there's two more stories here. One, uh, which became Lost Roses about Caroline's mother, Eliza. And I get so much mail and email about Eliza because um, people love her. She has a lot of, um, she was a real individual and fought hard for causes that she really believed in, which I think is where Caroline got it all. And uh, she, I, w I was sitting at the Bellamy Faraday house and we were doing a, a little photo shoot and I opened the desk drawer because they had me seated at the desk where, um, you know, they had on the tour Caroline's desk set up just as she left it. And so they wanted to um, take a picture of me sitting there. And so I opened her desk drawer and I found an old clipping from a newspaper and it was Caroline's picture was the, the main event in the clipping. And it was her wearing a, a Russian Kokoshnik, which is like a tiara and cradling a doll in her arms. And the, the clipping was all about how Caroline's mother had opened up their New York apartment, which was incredible and made it into a bazaar, a, a, a store essentially. And they were selling all of these Russian hand goods that had been made by women and men, actually, who had uh, survived the uh, Russian Revolution. And they were former aristocrats. And they had to flee the country with, with literally nothing, just the clothes on their backs, no passport, no anything. And the way that they survived was to just make these handmade things and... Um, Eliza sold them in New York and sent the proceeds back to them. So I, that just sent me on another whole uh, mission to find out the true story behind that. And it was really, it was really fun. I, I loved researching Lilac Girls and going to Germany and Poland and uh, France. But it was really, really fun to 
get out there and do that again and go to Russia and back to Paris again. Oh, boy, yeah. You really you really got to travel for this, didn't you? <laughs> I did. It was really, really – I did realize the first time that – going to the places, going to Germany and seeing Ravensbrück and seeing where the rabbits grew up in Poland, it helped those scenes come alive because I didn't know mm -hmm. anything about Germany or Poland. And uh, I did the same thing. I just kind of superstitiously did all the same things for the second book. I did the same. I, I do these giant outlines and um, I did that and uh, a character board with all the, the photographs of what I kind of imagine the characters to be. I did the exact same thing, and I thought, well, I traveled for Lilac Girls. I really have to go to Russia. And that was the trip of a lifetime. It was it was just so – it's just – travel is just so important, I think, to get out and see for yourself what what the country is like. And and Russia was really interesting. It I One of my characters, Sophia, is an aristocrat, so I had to go to every palace I could find – and, of course, those were oh, just really breathtaking. I mean, there's one where um, the amber room, the, the room is covered in amber. It's just crazy. One is all sapphire. Wow. You know, the excess was just so, it was really important to see that, I think, because you can read about it, but until you stand in that palace and look around you, you, you think, how could the czar spend money on this and really abdicate his responsibility to his people? So it was really, really helpful in writing and also going to the uh, more rural parts of Russia. And I had to feel what it was like to live in a small village because one of my other characters, Marinka, is a peasant. So, um, so it was really helpful to go there. And then... I finished my draft and gave it to my publisher and they said, we want more Paris in it because at the end they go to Paris, all of them meet up in Paris. So I thought, well, that's a pretty fun offer from my publisher. I have to take him up on that. Oh man, so I, you, he had to twist your arm, didn't he? I know, it was really hard. <laughs> Those profiteroles were calling me, but it, it was really fascinating because when I went back, I discovered this really interesting part of Paris that I had never known about and it's on Rue Daru and there's this incredible cathedral there and uh, the Alexander Nevsky Cathedral and I, I hadn't even put that in the first draft and there are all sorts of businesses still there. There's um, an old restaurant that is closed up now but it was where all the ex, ex um, the emigres would meet and that whole street was full of Russians at one time. So it was really on one hand spooky in a way. And um, on another hand, it was, it was so inspiring and it was like an archeological dig in a way. Now with Lilac Girls, you were writing about um, World War II and post World War II times. And so there's still people living who you could actually have direct, a direct resource. In Lost Roses, not so much. Um, you know, set in <laughs> what around 1914? I yes, think? exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and the book ends in, in 1919, but still. Um, do, so, does that make it? Did that make the research a little more difficult? It did. Uh, I mean, in in um, Lila Girls, my father-in-law. Um, he didn't pass away that long ago. I mean, he fought in World War II, so you know it, it was it was a lot harder to get um, kind of first-person accounts. And um, I did speak to one Russian emigre who was a child when his parents came here, and that was really helpful just to to hear what it was like to come to a country where they don't necessarily welcome you with open arms. That was helpful. But you know, I got a lot of um, I just I do a lot of research anyway with um, uh, books that are written, not, not necessarily history books, but are written at the time in the voice of the time. So that really helped me a lot, I think. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Martha Hall Kelly, author of Lost Roses, which is her second novel. Martha, I'm... I want to go back a little bit to um, when you said you never really set out to be a novelist. 
but you heard this wonderful story. So what did, you know, how did you start it? How did you, did you have a background in history or research or just, what was your background? I, I had a background in uh, journalism, actually. I went to Syracuse undergrad and then to Northwestern in Chicago for graduate school. And when I graduated, I, I did not become Barbara Walters as my, my parents really wanted me to. I became an <laughs> advertising copywriter. And I just remember thinking you can get paid to write commercials because I, I just thought that was the best thing ever. So I became an advertising copywriter. And I, I did that for about 12 years until I, you know, I had met my husband and traveled around with him and, and in every city that he was transferred to because he worked for Time Warner, I would work in an ad agency wherever we went. So it was, it was wonderful. And, but then I finally had my third child and we had moved up to Connecticut uh, cause I'm from Massachusetts and I, I think I was, I kept going north from New York trying to, you know, get more and more New England. And, uh, we had our third child and one day in, uh, he was a boy and a large child and he kicked the slats out of his crib and walked out of his crib. I think I kept him in there too long. And so I thought, <laughs> I have got to stay home with this child. Uh, and all three of them, because the two older girls were really active, too. So I just kind of I, I figured I, I've had my career and uh, I, I can go back to it someday. But right now, I really I, I can't um, abdicate my responsibilities here. And um, so that's what I did until. And so I just stayed home and not just stayed home. I think it is the hardest <laughs> job ever. Uh, for me, it was anyway. I, I'm, I'm, um, I, I, I get overwhelmed easily. So with a lot of going on. So um, I one one Mother's Day after my mom died, my husband saw that I was sad, and he said, "Why don't you up and see that house that you've always wanted to go see?" I had seen it in a clipping in Victorian magazine, and I I carried it around in my wallet, and I really wanted to see this house. And the title of the uh, Victoria Magazine article was Caroline's Incredible Lilacs. And I love old houses and uh, I, I love I, I love historical fiction and I love history, but I never studied them in any way. And I never took a creative writing class in school. So I went up there and I just started after that going back up there weirdly. I don't know why. Um, sometimes I think Caroline kind of, you know, cast a spell on me or something. But um, I started going up there and, and just spending time in her archives, which are in the old root cellar underneath the Welcome Center, and just going through her things. I was just fascinated with her. And she has files full of old pictures and dry cleaning tickets, and she kept everything. So I, I researched her for a while, not even knowing I was researching her. And then my, um, my husband and I went to... Uh, a Broadway play, and we met a couple, and the female half of the couple, her name was Betty Sargent, and um, I started talking to her about my research, which I've been doing for a couple of years, and I just said, you know, I, I found this story about these Polish women, Catholic women that were experimented on at a concentration camp for women, and Betty just said, did Mike tell you I'm a book editor? And I said, no, Mike did not tell me that. And <laughs> she said, uh, you should write this. It would make a great novel. All I need is a chapter. And I thought, well, that's very kind of her, but write a novel. I mean, there's no way. I, you know, I almost didn't even consider it seriously. And um, then my husband got transferred to um, – Atlanta, Georgia, not transferred. He accepted a job at the Weather Channel on the business side. And we went there with the slat kicker, Michael, and he enrolled <laughs> in school down there. And one day I went through um, and I, I had no friends, which, you know, I was I was from another place. And you know how it is when you're, you know, trying to make friends in a new place. Uh, I went through the Starbucks drive-through like I always did. And I ordered a decaf cappuccino grande 
And by mistake, the barista gave me a caffeinated one. And I went home and started writing Lilac Girls. It just kept pouring out. And it was really bad, I have to say. I, I wrote it all just like, I don't know. I, I know more now, not that I'm any kind of expert on novel writing, but I, I have read about 600 books on it. And I realize now that I was writing just kind of a narrative summary. But um, I eventually used it, part of it, in uh, this new book, actually, because this book goes back in time and, and uh, we see Caroline as a child. And, and that's where I started originally. But yeah, after that, I just wrote like a crazy person and eventually did all that travel and everything. And I, by the time I had a first draft, my husband came to me right before the holidays one year and said, you have to send this out because they were, they were worried because they thought I was insane. And I basically, (laughs) I think I was pretty crazy. And so I I picked a few agents and sent out queries and and I got some good responses and got an agent. So it all worked out. I, I, I don't know how. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> now, how much of these are of these stories is true to life, and how much is fictionalized, and how do you decide where to draw the line? Well, I, it really depends. I, in terms of Ravensbrook, all of that is true. I, I, I mean, if, I always try if I have the the true version of a scene or um, a story, I. I stick with that because it really is, you cannot make anything up that is more interesting or rings truer than the truth. So I, I, for Ravensbrook, especially, I had so much wonderful information and I had been there twice. I, I really wanted to bring that alive. So I, I, everything in that camp, everything that happens, what they wore, just all the little details, all the particularity is all real. Um, All of the, Polish characters at the camp are real. Uh, Kasia, who is the the so-called rabbit who's been experimented on, the main character from Poland, I made her a composite character of all the different women that I had been studying because they all wrote their memoirs, and I didn't feel like it was fair to just choose one. So she's kind of a composite character, uh, but she's also based on a woman named Nina Avanska, who had a sister who was a doctor, and Christina, and that's who I, if, if, if you know the character Zuzana, uh, I based her on Christina and I based Kasia on Nina Avanska with, um, you know, a liberal dose of all the other, other women as well. Um, so that other than kind of playing with the characters and uh, everything is real, Every, all the historical part of it is true. Same with Caroline. Um, she worked at the embassy. All of that is true. She went to see the rabbits and kind of vetted them and made sure they were healthy and brought them to the United States. All of their trip is true, how they went across America. Now, a lot of people ask me about Caroline's beau, Paul, and I really didn't want to give Caroline a love interest unless I knew that she had one. And it, and she didn't write anything about it. I never found anything in her archives. But then I spoke to her uh, French maid who told me a lot of really interesting things. And one of the things, that was a really cool, you know, time to spend with her. Uh, and she told me that Caroline had a, a, a long distance uh, boyfriend. And so after she told me that, I felt like I could go ahead and give Caroline a love interest, even though I didn't have a picture of him, but I based it on on that man. So, uh, and then with her to Oberhauser, she was a real person, and I stuck to history with her as much as I knew it. I, I filled in some kind of personal things because I needed to make her real. That's one thing my agent told me when she first took me on was, you know, I'll represent you, but you need to make her to more real. So I had to go back and kind of give her a backstory, and uh, I knew some things about her, but I, I had to fill that in. So um, I, I'd say the backbone of it, and, and most of it really is, is real. Now, how about in Lost Roses with Eliza? Is the uh, Sophia, were they actually friends? And did she go to Paris with her and all these things? She had many Russian friends. And um, I just picked, I, again, as I did with Kasha, I kind of put them all together and made Sophia. 
And I based Sophia on a Russian countess uh, named Edith Selahub. And she was amazing. She's my, my, um, my hero because she had this incredibly uh, privileged life and uh, adapted to losing everything in such a graceful way. And uh, they, not every aristocrat did. And I, I really loved her. So I based Sophia on her. And Eliza did not go on that mission as I have it in the book that I know of. But I have her doing that to just to make the story better. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Martha Hall Kelly, author of Lost Roses and Lilac Girls. Mom, I want to give you a chance to ask some questions here. Well, I was just uh, uh, wondering when you when you were when you were uh, researching about the uh, Ravensbrook, uh, was that wasn't that kind of a it was kind of hard? Was that difficult? Sad to to, to do some of that research? Uh, well, I brought my son with me, and I, I have to say, I don't think I will win any Mom of the Year awards because I really kind of pushed him to, he, he was videoing the whole thing for me and taking photographs, and I didn't realize that it was as hard for him as it was, and one day he came to me and said, you know what, Mom, I, I just, I need to take a break because this is really hard. You know, we were down in the punishment bunker and it was really I, I, I it was really eye opening because, no, it wasn't hard for me. I don't know why. I, I, I think there's maybe something wrong with me that I wasn't more kind of um, uh, horrified. I mean, I was horrified by it, but I felt so beholden to these women and I had fallen in love with them so much. And there were only five of them still alive at that point. But I thought. I have to get this right for them. And I felt really mm -hmm. responsible. So that was my motivation. I, I went around that camp documenting every, documenting everything. And I just was trying to soak it all in and feel what it was like to really live there and, and go through it. So I, I was more focused on that. And I, I just didn't, I didn't let myself go there to the part of, you know, this is, I, I, I'm a really empathetic person anyway. Um, and I, I just feel that naturally. But uh, so when I came back to write it, all of the I, I got to use all of that real um, information that I had seen and felt and smelled and came back. And that's when I did my um, emoting on the page. Mm -hmm. And it, it proved to be successful for sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was interested in the uh, was it Eliza that. Uh, uh, organized the relief programs for the Russian women and children? Yes. She was. Yeah. yeah, I talk about that a little bit in Lilac Girls because they hold a Te Descent. And if, if you remember, Paul comes in with all the um, the, the actors from his troupe and they, they help with Eliza's cause, which kind of endears him to her. But um, once I wrote that and I discovered the story of Eliza, I just thought this would be perfect. I don't have to give up these characters. I can show yeah. Eliza in action, which, you know, she brought all of those women out to her home in kind of snooty Long Island. And I just thought that would be really, really important for us to see as a country today. You know, what was it like when yeah. they brought these foreigners to, uh, you know, elite Southampton, how would they react? And, and, they did not react well. Let's put it that way. No, but she she stood up to him. I I love that part. Where she oh, good. Really stood up to him. Yeah, I love that, that was great. Part too. <laughs> because, you know those Woolsey women. They and and that's what Eliza considered herself too. She oh my goodness. She did not hesitate if she felt something no. was uh, wrong or someone had been wronged. She she stood up and I started doing that for a while after I was researching those women and. Um, somebody said to me, you know, you have to stop doing that because you're going to, you know, get hurt. <laughs> Someone threw some trash out of their window of their car and I made them roll down their window and take their trash back. Down <laughs> and, Good for you. And somebody later said, you know, Martha, you, 
you're going to get in trouble. And so I, I still do it. But um, I think it's just I, once you read about these women, you, you just get inspired by them. Now, Eliza's mother also what seemed to be um, a real activist. So is she your next book? No, actually, that's Carrie, and um, she is in this. We we need to have a uh, like a family tree in front of us. But Eliza's mother, Carrie, it was one of those eight children that lost their father, and her sister Georgian was the nurse at Gettysburg. So this, my next book is about Caroline's great aunt, Georgian. So Does that, that make sense? We need, have, like, we need to have a pencil to write all this stuff. I know. And, and then are you done or are you going to go back to the fi- founding matriarch? <laughs> um, wow. Oh, you mean go back to the mom? Yeah. Wow. I could do that. I thought three was kind of a nice number to, to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I have two more ideas. I think maybe um, another world war ii idea that i i'm in love with that i've been doing a lot of research running around and trying to to talk to survivors because there's you know so few left and they're in their 90s and another thing that's a completely different genre which i'm really excited about too so Mm. but but you never know i i might come back to that i might come back to jane eliza because she was she was pretty cool well it's interesting to me how many there probably are so so many stories like this of women that history has kind of forgotten except maybe there's a little pocket a museum somewhere or or somewhere in the town they grew up that people still remember but the story hasn't been told in a wider way and historical fiction is kind of an ideal way to introduce some of these stories Absolutely. And a lot of people do it really, really well. And I think women especially had, it's, it's kind of a, a gold mine of old untouched stories because for so long women were just marginalized. So mm-hmm. it's really, really fun to go back and celebrate someone like Caroline Faraday, who was very, very modest. And at the time, you know, in the early 50s and, and during World War II, it really was unseemly to broadcast, you know, none of them would, it, given the chance, have uh, Instagrammed or, you know, been on Twitter or anything. And especially back in Civil War times, it was really, you were considered really um, trashy to, if you even spoke in public. So... It's really, it's really interesting to go back and see how times have changed and how women uh, didn't really have a chance. So it's nice to celebrate them. I, I want to go back a minute, and uh, we just finished doing a, a book about um, uh, World War II and concentration camps. And uh, did you know that there were that there were orchestras in there in those yes. camps? Yes, it's so sad, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, just. Yeah, but it, it, it was wonderful because that one of the one of our, uh, our heroines, one of our books was, she had a violin, she had a Stradivarius violin, and she could, she was fantastic, and so she was able to survive because she played in the orchestra. And it, I had, you know, I I'd never heard of that before. I thought that was a, very interesting. Yes, not at Ravensburg, but at other camps for sure. And uh-huh. it, you're right; it was a really. A uh, lucky thing for them that they got to stay alive, but it's also I just find it so sad that they were forced to play for the Nazis. Yeah, and, I know. And there must be tremendous survivor guilt because they, oh, all, yeah. some people were dying. So um, it's it's a fascinating uh, part of history. Yeah, I know. For her, she she felt why why me? You know why what what could I have done? What else could I have done? You know, she was just of course surviving but but um nothing i mean if she tried to help anyone she would join them yeah oh yeah and what's sad too is that in some of the communities that were um, occupied by the nazis throughout europe that later anyone who cooperated with the nazis sometimes was treated very badly afterwards by the rest Mm -hmm. of the community which you can understand, but also they maybe were just trying to survive. 
you know, it's. Yeah, the French, those pictures of the French women that collaborated are so, oh, mm -hmm. you see them and you just, your heart breaks mm -hmm. for them on one hand, but then, you know, because they had had German lovers and they shaved their heads and they marched them through the streets and some of them have babies in their arms. It's really, oh, it's really, really sad. But yeah. on the other hand, it, you know, people lost their lives yeah. because they didn't collaborate. So yeah. it's a tough yeah, I just, oh boy, I hope we never have to go through that again I anywhere know. in the world. Maybe maybe there are places in the world where people are suffering like that. I don't know. but um, Sure. Now, Martha, it does seem in historical fiction that World War II is a more popular um, subject than World War One. at least right now. That, you know, we have a lot of World War II based things. Why do you think that is? You know, that's a great question. And I think that it isn't that long ago, really. Uh, it's, you know, we can relate to it more and we know more about it. I think in, in history nowadays, they uh, in history class, they have so little time. They just kind of gloss right over everything. World War Two is just more relatable. And World War One, though, um, once I got into it, was fascinating. And it really... You almost need to know about World War One to really understand World War Two and what's going on today, with and True. why Germany reacted the way they did in World War Two. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know the reparations and all of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I I found it that I was a very uh, what's the word I, I was not a very good history student, and um, uh, so it's really nice to go back and uh, discover history. I, I didn't like it in school because it was taught in such a way that it was all about memorizing dates and the boys in the class were always so into the hardware. And I just was not interested in the planes and the guns and the bombs. And when I went back and looked at it from a female point of view, it was so interesting what they were doing and how they worked in the underground and it, what they wore. And, and it, it just all became so much more interesting. I wasn't really aware that the Russian Revolution was happening kind of at the same time as Russia's involvement in World War One. So you had the the Imperial Army fighting in World War One, and at the same time you had the revolutionaries trying to overthrow the Tsar. I wonder how, you know, did you learn much about how those two events intersected? Yes, actually. Um, I think that there, and I'm no scholar, so there's probably people out there thinking, you know, is she a history person? Not, I mean, this is just what I learned, but um, I believe the Russian Revolution was a result in, in large part of the war. The Tsar bungled the war so badly and uh, his people were starving and it just was a mess. And once the war came to an end is when the Russian revolution started because uh, people, the Russian people were just literally sick and tired of it. They, they uh, were not, uh, they, they felt like they had been had and used and they really had in a way. And so that's why they rose up. And at that point, the czar was on the ropes himself. It, that whole part of it, how the czar abdicated it's, it's just fascinating. And, and no one would help him. None of his relatives in, in England or uh, anywhere would reach out. And they, they really thought that somebody would come to their aid. And of course, they didn't. That, that's all tragic too. the whole the Russian family and his children, because they were they really were lovely children and raised in a very strict way by their mother. They slept on army cots in the, one of the palaces. So uh, they were sadly um, victims in this whole thing. Their parents were just, you know, in so many ways. We would need a whole nother session to talk about that. But uh, the czar was just such a um, a despot in so many ways. And but the, these children were were just innocent uh, bystanders. Did Did Anastasia really survive? You know, there was that. Or was that just a uh, uh... No. Again, I'm not an expert, but I don't believe that she did. I, I think they pretty conclusively found all of them, and they have um, interred them in a church 
that actually I visited in St. Petersburg, which was wow. very, very sad. So many people coming to visit it and leaving flowers and remembrances. It was really incredible. But from what I could tell, and I, I did dig into it pretty deeply, um, they have conclusively found that they, they've identified all of the, the remains. As much as we would like to, and myself included, uh, think that she survived, I mean, what they went through in their last days was was horrible. And I would like to think that someone survived, but it just, it doesn't make sense. The way that they were murdered in the basement, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just how, yeah. how did a person survive? They, they, they made sure that they were, that they were dead. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Now you mentioned the yeah. character of Barinka, the peasant girl who was helping um, Sophia with childcare. And I'm not going to give any spoilers here, but it comes to play a pretty large part in. Um, yeah. In no, this. She, was, she was an interesting character. Where did, where did the idea of having that whole thing with uh, about the sun and everything where did that you come know, from? You know, I guess just my imagination. <laughs> Down, I do these giant outlines, and I just thought, okay, I need three characters, and I knew Eliza would be one, and then Sophia representing, uh, you know, the uh, Russian aristocrats, and then I needed a third person, and I just started thinking about, you know, a lot of these uh, St. Petersburg aristocrats had summer homes, dacas, but these were, you know, substantial uh, estates just south of St. Petersburg near where the Tsar had his um, summer place, his favorite Alexander Palace. And so I thought, well, what if they had a place down there and then a peasant girl came to work for them? And then I took it from there. Now, how about the and, cook? And, yeah, and Yes, oh, Cook. Yes. Well, you know, Cook kind of evolved. I um, I don't know. I just thought it would be nice to have Sophia married and maybe have another man that it likes her. I don't know. That's always fun. Um, so, <laughs> you know, he just kind of sprang up from there. I didn't plan on him, but he kind of took over. You know, that I... I hate it when authors say that, that, oh, something happened. And I, I, I mean, I made it happen, but I liked the idea once I started playing with it, that there would be another man there because once her husband went off to war, you know, there, there is no other male interest around. So I just, I thought that would be fun. Well, you had, you had a lot of interesting characters in this book. I mean, and um, I'm, I'm glad that you included uh, Varenka, the the peasant girl, because and her mother, her mother was very interesting. Oh, I love her. She, she was a, a fortune teller and a, a, an outstanding seamstress. Oh gosh, that was great. And really educated. Was. So how did this educated woman end up as a peasant here? Well, that's what I wanted to show that all the peasants weren't necessarily just born peasants, but they come from various places. Her father had been educated and. You know, she just kind of fell into this very difficult life. She she basically had some form of consumption or something and mm -hmm. um, became very sick. And her daughter lived with her and was kind of, um, oh, kind of teased by the people in town. And her ward, her husband's ward, a former apprentice, lived with them, too. And I just thought that that family dynamic was kind of interesting. Yes, it definitely was, and uh, and a little surprising at times. Yes, and we can't say. <laughs> but... No. <laughs> right. Yeah. My editor wanted me to change that, but I said, no, 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 I'm keeping it. Sometimes I get to have my way, which is nice. Well, why did the editor want to change it? Well, it's kind of hard without talking yeah, about it. Yeah, it is. Okay. It's unfair <laughs> to the audience to tease them. I Someday we'll talk about that. You okay. know, the, you know, they have their reasons for not liking things. Um, you know, there were a few things in Lilac Girls that they asked me to take out that were just a little bit kind of too rough. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, we negotiated and um, I I'm all for that kind of thing, especially at a place like Ravensburg, where I feel like it's really important to feel what it was like there, because in that book, if you get to the end, and you haven't felt that, you don't feel what it was like to be liberated. 
And I really mm-hmm. wanted people to feel the same thing that the characters felt. And that in, in every book, I feel that way. I want you to feel like you're in the Ruf- Russian Revolution and you're, everything you have is being taken away from you. And sometimes that requires, you know, some, some difficult things. Well, when, when I get, <clears throat> I finish the book, I like to go back and start over. Which I oh, did. I love you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because you forget what happened in some of the things. And it was like when that, in Varinka, in her, in her first chapter, when the, the tax collector came to their uh, house. I mean, yes. that really set, that that set the scene of how, how oppressed they were. You know, really I'm so did. glad you mentioned that because that's a big part of why I wanted to have a peasant character because I wanted to show that, that the, you know, here's this one woman who's a cousin to the czar who has a pretty great life, but not everybody had it so easy. And I, I'm glad you liked that because I felt like it really showed what a horrible existence it was to be a peasant. Yeah. It sure did. And then, but then you it show did. also like the um, the aristocrats weren't all bad. They weren't all good. They, you know, they had a mix. So Sophia thought she was doing as much as she could for people. You know that she was generous and and helping people, and yet the peasants didn't necessarily see it that way. You know, I'm so, wow, you two are such close readers. Um, I'm glad that you, you kind of gleaned that from everything because I really was trying, that's what I was trying to say, <laughs> that, you know, sometimes we even today uh, think that what we're doing is helpful and all we can do, but it's not always the case. You can be kind of kidding yourself that uh, it's a much deeper problem and there are other ways to go after it. Of course, after it all happened, uh, she, I think, understood, and it's so often the case, but a lot of the aristocrats, when they were going through it, they just thought, oh, this will be over soon, it's just another, you know, revolt by the peasants, and what's the big deal, and I think that that's, it's, it's something that's kind of a thread in every one of these books, like the German people during World War II, and in this country, too, we're all very kind of blasé about it at one point um and in germany they were just like you know well this will be over soon and everything's fine we're not doing anything bad to the jews and you know you kid yourself and the same thing is true for the civil war book that i'm writing now When, when we entered into that as a as a country both sides thought oh it'll be over in a week two weeks maybe a month tops and i i think that for me anyway it's been really eye opening Martha, I wanted yeah. to tell you, we had family members who fought in the Civil War, and um, I have letters from a soldier in the Civil War to kind of a distant family member. And this man was in, um, he was from Iowa, which is where we are now, and he fought mostly like in Missouri and on down south. So one of the letters, he's on a prison no, he's on a hospital ship outside, outside of Vicksburg. Oh, oh my God! You're when kidding. the no, when the siege of Vicksburg was going on. Oh my goodness! Yeah, because <laughs> I'm writing. I'm not kidding. Right before you called, that's what I'm writing about a hospital ship. Seriously? Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. All world. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. And he survived, obviously. He survived. Yeah. And in another one, he's in Missouri, and they were. This is this is the thing that I found so really really interesting. He writes about how they're marching around Missouri, and whenever they see black men, they say, "Fall in with us, fall in." Well, you know, just come with us. And said most of them won't come. They say because Missouri was still a slave state at the time, and uh-huh. so they're behind enemy lines basically. And they say, well, I would, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid what Massa would do if he caught me. And then they get back to the Union camp and the general or whoever was in charge there would not let them bring those slaves behind the lines into the camp. Yeah. That's Um, so interesting. Yeah, there was some, I don't know, some political thing that they would not bring them in. So he, he writes that they took up a collection 
of money and gave them directions north and said, and I think I think some of them probably made it because they were pretty smart. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. You know, there's so many good Civil War stories. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I'm having such a great time writing this third book. It's so fun because those kind of stories are, are, they'll get lost if we don't publish them and yeah. make sure people remember what the Civil War was about. Germany and Poland were interesting to write about and Russia too. But for me, writing about my own country, I mean, it's it's really moving and it hits close to home. And so much of it is, is it's like we haven't learned from it. Uh, I feel like we're yeah, still right. Civil War. So yeah. it's really, it's fascinating. And how those slaves were treated and um, my my plantation that I write about is in Maryland. So that was a border state. But there was still tremendous, even towards the end of the war, after the Emancipation Proclamation, the, the slaves were terrified that they would be just, even the, the freed slaves that had papers were terrified that they'd be taken and just, you know, very much like what happened in 12 Years a Slave. Um, it really, it was happening all over uh, Pennsylvania and the northern states. These slave robbers would come up and just grab children indiscriminately. Any any uh, African American person was at risk. Uh, at, yeah, and risk. it's yeah. it was terrifying. So I mean, I I didn't know that, and there's so much great hidden history about Civil War. And we have actually had we have a, a underground railroad station just south of here. Oh and, really? Uh, what, yeah, what? and and then actually, I think my great great grandmother was didn't Monica wasn't Melinda wasn't she a uh, yeah. Didn't she have an underground According to her station? obituary, yeah, that she ran a station on the Underground Railroad. Really? Yeah. Did she have yeah. a hotel or was it just her house? Just farm, farmhouse. Yeah. Really? Wow, what a legacy. You yeah. must be so proud of that. Yeah. I would want to go buy it and, and have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should try and find out where it was. That's a good idea. We should research that. There were quite yeah. a few in this in this part of Iowa because we're we're not too far. Well, she was further north. She was in the middle of Iowa, but where we live now, we're only one county up from Missouri, so from the Mason Dixon line. So, oh so, wow! Yeah, so there was a lot of um, underground railroad activity here. Wow, and especially dangerous for the slaves because they could be taken so easily. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. fascinating, isn't it? I think there, that it, once you get into it, it's it, you can't stop talking about it. Oh, I know. I also, one of his letters, one of the soldier's letters, he writes about um, he was up for a position an, as an officer in the Iowa uh, Black Regiment. And so I'm like, wait a minute, was this guy black? Well, I went and did a little research and no, all the officers in the Black Regiment were white. But, yeah. But... Um, but there was an entire regiment of black soldiers, and virtually yeah. every free black man in Iowa joined. Wow. You know, that just, it makes me want to cry, honestly. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. And there it were is. many, many like that. And the one that I researched that was um, from upstate New York, they were offered, uh, I think, $7 a week or, or less. Maybe it was $3. And they said, no, keep it. We're not going to take it unless we're paid equally to the white soldiers. And I just thought that was really so interesting. They'd rather have no money than um, not be paid equally. And eventually they were. So uh, I, I weave some of that into my my um, Civil War book. And I just I, I love it. I, I just think that uh, everybody needs to know about that. And then the other thing that we don't think about, and this came up um, in an interview I recorded last week um, with Mitchell Jackson, author of Survival Map, where after manumission, when the slaves were freed, they were freed to nothing. Right. They, oh, that's uh, another really good point. Yes, that I yeah. was just... No yeah, just... home, no money, no... no real estate the clothes on their back basically was it it's interesting isn't it there was yeah. no at first there was some uh, right after the war uh, you know i think um lincoln's assassination really threw everybody for a loop but um there was there was some attempt made but pretty soon after that nothing yeah. and in 
phase, they were worse off mm -hmm. physically because they had no food, uh, no clothes that had been provided for them, because, of course, because the plantation owners were trying to, you know, get uh, service out of them. So that was the only reason that they clothed and fed them because they were property. But after that, it was almost worse what they did to them, just kind of uh, threw them out. let threw them out. Or, well, I mean, uh, the plantation owners were, out, were always saying, hey, come on back, we'll take you back. But yeah. you know, I think that, and some did stay, but yeah. I think it was a matter of pride for, for, for so many. And I can really understand that. They wanted to just go anywhere but there and their freedom oh my god they they had so many uh, celebrations and they right afterwards they just they couldn't believe how how wonderful it was to be free but then it set in that you know winter came and and they were freezing and no one would hire them in some cases and then in the south of course it it got really bad quickly because all of those what they called um patty rollers which you know patrollers were um they turned into the kkk and that of course you know we all know the horror of that so are you getting into that's still, that that's still going <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. are you getting into that in this new book at all yes wow. absolutely i mean the more the more i i find out about the hidden history the more i include wow. just because i think it's so important to understand I mean, we learn about it in school, but just in such a cursory way. And I love oh, yeah. oh, yeah. the real, the real story, what it was like to be enslaved on a plantation and uh, uh, from a first person, what, what did it feel like to uh, go through all that? And to be the, uh, my three characters are an enslaved young girl um, and the, the mistress of the plantation that um, owns the girl, and um, she's a piece of work, and uh, I guess she's a character. And then Georgianne uh, Woolsey, who's a nurse on the Civil War battlefield, and wow. the three of them meet up at some point. So, you know, it's, the, it's very similar um, in terms of structure, but a completely different story. And I, I'm so into it, I have to say. I wish I, you had video. I would show you my character board with all the... Uh all the characters so well, we're looking forward to that yeah maybe you could maybe you can send it to me um i would great the um how did you come up with the structure of of each of these stories being told from three different points of view three main characters you know i love historical fiction and i had read a couple of books that used that same technique and I remember at first I was reading all these, you know, at night I would read history books because I didn't know anything about World War II. And I would um, read how to write a novel books because I didn't know anything about writing a novel. And one of the things that they talked about was point of view. And it was so confusing because there is close third person, close second, you know, all these different points of view. And I just thought, you know what, I have so much on my plate. I'm just going to write it from first person point of view from three different narrators and you know that's just what I, I just chose that because it was what I felt um easiest and and now that I have you know two books behind me I I think I also chose it kind of unwittingly because it's very personal and you feel I, everything I read that is first person I really really love and I go back to one of the very first books that I read in high school that I, I always go back and reread. And it's called Good Times, Bad Times by John Kirkwood, and who sadly died very young from AIDS. But I love this book, and it's written in first-person point of view. And I went back recently and read it again, and I thought, this is why I wrote in first-person. Because, I it, you know, you can just get into the head of the character. And yeah, I, it is, with so many things like Netflix and uh, you know, that's my competition, frankly. And I feel like if I can write a book that kind of takes you to that same place, I've done my job. That's, and it's worked for you, obviously. Yes, it I, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to keep, keep doing, keep doing some it. variation, not always three different characters, because that's hard, but, um, uh, but, but I'd like to experiment with everything. Great. But, well, but we're, like we're out of time. 
So we're going to have to. Well, say, that flew by. <laughs> but we're going to have to say goodbye. But mom, do you have some final words for us? I do, and uh, okay. I, want, I want people to remember that no one really makes it alone, and so have a grateful heart to be and, and be quick to acknowledge those people that help you along the way. Oh, that's really beautiful. I needed that too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> and see you all next week on Writers Voices. Bye-bye.